I'm uh, extremely excited to uh, welcome um, uh, Helen Sturm Ryan to uh, the Jordan Center and to the Slavic Department to speak about her ongoing work. Um, Helen is uh, now a visiting assistant professor at the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures at Swarthmore College, but will soon be beginning an exciting new uh, job uh, uh, in a position of lecturer in Russophone Literatures and Cultures at University of St. Andrew. Helen has published articles in journals such as Feminist German Studies, uh, Russian Review, Nova Literaturne Vazrenia, and she has also co-edited with Vadim Schneider <clears throat> an issue in Russian literature on the unknown 19th century. And that's just out or about? It's still under review. Okay, oh, okay, okay, okay. For some, um, somehow I was <laughs> expecting it. been for a while. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, the, the, the 19th century remained unknown. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Until then. Um, so um, yeah, and but this this particular project comes uh, in part out of uh, Helen's uh, heroic work as the coordinator of the other 19B uh, reading group dedicated to introducing less well-known um, authors into uh, discussions in our field. One of the many things I admire about Helen's work is her commitment to combining uh, approaches drawn from both philological and social theoretical fields, while also broadening the scope of 19th century studies by introducing less well-known figures. I know a number of us are looking forward to the completion, no pressure, <laughs> of the book project, uh, Helen's book project, originally titled Grave Diggers of Realism, Proletarian Writers in Russian Literature from 1857 to 1878. Uh, the title of today's talk, which comes from research supported by the Keenan Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center, is Writing the Crowd uh, of the Human World, Nation, and Proletariat in Fyodor Shetnikov's Ethnographic Fictions. Yeah. Thank you for that very nice introduction and for the invitation to speak here and share my work and thank you Sasha for all of your organizing efforts. Um, so this talk comes from a chapter of my book that I'm currently working on and it's really work in progress. So I am looking forward to hearing people's questions and um, let me keep thinking about this material. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing you to a character who is importantly connected to Fyodor Shetnikov, who I'm going to focus on today. And he comes from a work that's much more well known than anything that Shetnikov wrote, uh, Nikolai Nikrasov's Kamu na Rusi Jit Kharasho, uh, which was written between 1866 and 1877. So, hopefully. Okay, my clicker doesn't. That's okay. There we go. Okay, Grisha Dabraskolnov. So, Grisha Dabraskolnov appears in the conclusion to Kamu na Rusiji Karasho. And as a whole, this poem, um, epic poem, narrates a group of peasants' search for those residents of the Russian Empire who live well, mostly to no avail. Nobody is living well. And Dabraskolnov is also not living well when we meet him. He's uh, we're told of his impoverished upbringing as the son of a poor country deacon, but his bitter memories serve a purpose in the poem. Um, they give rise to revolutionary conviction, and ultimately Dabraskolnov offers a vision for a better life that would be shared by peasants and non-peasants alike. And he delivers a song of spiritual healing through shared national being that's inspired by the sight of toiling barge hobblers on the Volga River. So this book poetry of Dabrasklonov offers one literary model for invoking a collective of the people across classes. Through Dabrasklonov, the reader is sharing in the collective power of barge haulers. And Fyodor Shetnikov's writings offer a different model of collectivity, but the fictional Dabrasklonov and the real that is Shetnikov are also importantly intertwined. 
that Raskolna was a character that Nekrasov created based on real examples, and one of those was Grushchenko. So in my talk today, I'm going to look at the relationship between the real writer Ryshevnikov, Nekrasov's fictionalization of his legacy um, as a way of looking at how representations of the common people in the radical literary tradition offer different ways of relating Russian national identity to the existing diversity of the Russian empire in the 1860s and 1870s. So Nekrasov's image of the toiling barge haulers um, that represent the collective power of the common people might immediately bring to mind this painting by Ilya Repin. This was completed a few years before Nekrasov finished his poem, but there are other precedents for the uh, Raskolnov's significant encounter with barge haulers. Nekrasov himself wrote a poem about a barge hauler 20 years earlier in 1854, um, and this poem helped establish this figure in the kind of pantheon of populist rhetoric about the people. And then 10 years after Nikolasov published his first barge hauler poem um, in 1864, Reshevnikov published his own literary portrait of barge haulers. So at that time, Nikolasov was the publisher and editor of Sabranyanik, the contemporary, and Reshevnikov was a 23-year-old from Perm who had just come to St. Petersburg to try to make a career as a writer. And he wrote to Nikolasov promising the editor a new view of the barge hauler based on his own experience growing up on the Kama River. He wrote, I know well so Nekrasov published that work, which was dedicated to Nekrasov. And in Sabremianik, the work that resulted from these observations, and that was Rishetnikov's breakthrough publication, the novella Padik of the So from Nekrasov to Rishetnikov to Raven, and back to Nekrasov with Dabraskolnov, this figure of the barge hauler variously relates an intelligentsia readership to the common people. Nikrasov's original 1854 poem defines the barge hauler as a type in the naturalist mode. Rashetnikov's Padlipotsi instead tells the story of how ethnic Komi peasants become barge haulers. Dabraskolnov's poem, as in Rapin's painting, um, in that poem, the labor of the barge haulers conjures broader civic belonging. The barge haulers represent the suffering and the strength of the people or Narod as a collective. In Rus, the poem that's penned by fictional Dabraskolnov um, that I read at the beginning, this is explicitly a way of representing the Russian nation. But in Nekrasov's poem, it's not only the barge haulers who come to symbolize national collectivity, it is Dabraskolnov himself. So Reshetnikov in his career was also serving and expected to serve in some sense as a mediator like Dabraskolnov between his readers and the people that he wrote about. And part of what made Reshetnikov's barge hauler narratives seem interesting and important to Nikrasov was exactly what he outlines in his letter, that he, unlike Nikrasov himself, was writing from experience from his direct intimate observations as a young man who grew up on the Kama River among these barge haulers. Um, and this was a story that Rishetnikov told about himself, which helped him sell his work. And it was also based in reality. He really was a writer from a very different background from Nikrasov um, and from most other writers at that time. He was a self-educated orphan who never attended university. He lived roughly throughout his life and he died at age 29 in 1871 from complications from tuberculosis. His career lasted about seven years and he produced really a remarkable amount of interesting literature in that time. Well, Nikolasov, of course, was a nobleman, a successful businessman, and a celebrated poet. So as an editor, Nikolasov helped Roshetnikov build a career. And as an author, he transformed him into a literary character. A decade after the publication of Padlipotsi in 1876, this also after Roshetnikov's death, Roshetnikov's first letter to Nikolasov is echoed in the experience of Davros Golnov as he walks along the Volga. Uh, so 
Григорий шел, подглядывал на бурлака, довольного, с двух слова сливались, то шепотом, то громкие. This is from Burlak, um, or Barge Holler, which is the poem that brings Grisha to the moment of inspiration that leads to his final glorious song, Rus, which I quoted above. Бурлака мысли Гришими ко все Руси загадочные к народу перешли. Looking at the barge holler, his thoughts go to the people. Um, so through the Rasplonov's subjective view, which echoes this description of Rishetnikov's of his own, of, of where his story Padipotsi came from, the barge holler refracts an image of the people, the Russian nation. And the Rasplonov himself is essential for this image. And this character, um, Nikrasov, consolidated and mythologized the legacies of a number of writers um, who were his colleagues in the 1860s. Um, including, is something wrong? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll have to explain what I got. <laughs> The case is one seems an expanded version of the other. <laughs> I, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> they both have the exact same glasses. And uh, this is the expression you had to wear if you were a writer of the people in the 1860s. So the only way you could, you know, the only appropriate way to look upon the world with this kind of reserved concern. Um, yes, well, imagine these two faces blended together and then you can mm. see the brask well enough. Mm. I was afraid I put some like, wrong name up here. <laughs> okay. Um, so, one inspiration for Dabra Klonov is Dabra Lyubov. This is, will continue to be confusing because it's sort of on purpose confusing. Was Dabra Lyubov, uh, the critic Dabra Lyubov, another Reshetnikov, and also other writers similar to Reshetnikov, like Mikhail Komilovsky, um, who go into the image of this um, kind of mythologized version of the writer of the people from the 1860s, who Nikrasov comes up with after most of these people that the character is based on have died. Um, and in a way, this character that Nikasov creates, Dabras um, does a better job of fulfilling the mediating role that was asked of Reshenikov or Pamilovsky than they did themselves. Um, and that's something I think that makes their work interesting. It kind of challenges this symbolic unity that we find in Nikrasov's vision of Rus and perhaps proposes some different kinds of collectivity. So Nikrasov Dobrosklonov links his readers to the barge holler in a portrait of national collectivity to which a noble reader can feel as connected as anyone else. And Reshevnikov instead roots his peripatetic laborers in a de depiction of a material struggle that he shared in himself and from which his intelligentsia readers are excluded. And that was the struggle of proletarianization, which was really the primary subject of his work. So this is a scene from Reshetnikov's novel, Where Is It Better, Gideon Lutsha, which was published in 1868. Um, and this is a description of the railroad construction, and there's just all of this kind of social and natural upheaval. I'm just going to read the part in bold. <laughs> Пашни казали с оброшными, в деревнях виднее столько дети, глухие, слепые и больные старые люди, да тоже скот, меньше и меньше становилось по дороге лесу, и там, где было поле, земля была ископана на несколько пунктов внутрь. So in this passage, Reshenikov is emphasizing the social and the physical destruction of agrarian life. Um, the traditional life world of the Russian peasantry appears here to either no longer exist or be well on its way to oblivion, which might have been an exaggeration of what was actually going on at this time, but it's quite a dramatic um, scene. And what appears in its place is what 
Marx would have called the lumpen proletariat. They're disconnected from traditional life worlds, but quite far from the means of production or from becoming a kind of organized uh, labor force. So this total immiseration of the peasantry was essentially the worst fear of all elites in the late 1860s, no matter their political persuasion, liberal, Slavophile, populist. Um, it was either a moral blight or a political threat or both at the same time. Um, and in Rechetnikov's depiction, this is certainly a, a narration of struggle and tragedy, but there's also small ways in which tentative new collectivity emerges. People are bound together by the shared search for someplace better, as the title puts it, which reconstitutes diverse populations among the so-called common people into this heterogeneous roaming mass that shows up on the highway here. So in contrast to Nikrasov's poetic representation of Rus, voiced by his folk hero, Dabras um, Roshetnikov's work doesn't strive to link his subjects to his readers, and he doesn't articulate any spiritual common core of Rus. It's rather the experience of proletarianization being uprooted from traditional life that unites the common people in Roshetnikov's work. Um, but as we dig deeper in Roshetnikov's ethnographic fictions, we'll also see that his emergent proletariat can only overcome certain ethnic and confessional boundaries between Russian workers and Komi peasants, between old believers and uh, modern orthodoxy, but not in his work between Russians and Jews. So in the remainder of the talk, I'm going to look at exactly what kind of collectivity Roshetnikov evokes um, in his sketches of proletarianization and how its shape is determined in part by his authorial persona. So we'll look at how he constructs that persona. Um, and then I'll look at some of his Jewish sketches from written around the same time as this novel, Vidya uh, Lutsha. And then in conclusion, I'll briefly situate these depictions in relation to Yeskov and Dostoevsky's depictions of imperial diversity. And I want to show how in the Reshetnikov's work, there's both a remarkable notion of collectivity in relation to di imperial diversity that diverges from other well-known literary models of the time. Um, and also we can see the limitations of a notion of class belonging that's not considering national and ethnic difference. But before going into more detail about Ashetnikov's work, I just want to take a moment to address the figure of the narod and the meanings carried by this term in a more abstract um, way. So I'm trying to think about whether the figure of the narod, especially in the radical discourse, was implied to be exclusively ethnically Russian, or whether other imperial minorities might be included in this collective. This word converges meanings, national and popular, Russian and common, and this convergence of meanings is apparent in the fact that peasants in mid 19th century literature were almost always Russian or Ukrainian, even though the common people, so called, were in reality incredibly diverse. So there was kind of a generic difference between how Russian or Ukrainian peasants would be depicted versus uh, ethnic minorities that are not Russian or Ukrainian would be in ethnographic sketches or nonfiction studies of that sort. But the literature of the peasantry is by default the literature of the Russian peasantry. So how did this convergence of meanings of nation and common people function in the radical sphere specifically? In the writing of Chernyshevsky and Debra Lyubov, based on what I've read, ethnic Russian particularity doesn't appear to be a primary concern, as it was, for instance, for the Slavophiles. Instead, there's an idea of nationality that's understood to take shape as part of a teleological process of shedding national particularities and essentially becoming modern subjects or citizens, but Russophone subjects if we're talking about the Russian nation, the Russian empire. And in their writings, they're not really distinguishing between those things. Um, and this was an image ultimately of a kind of egalitarian Russophone citizenship of the empire. In Debra Lyubov's 1858 essay on the degree of participation of nationality in the development of Russian literature, 
he describes how the Russian literary tradition is one in which bookish European forms are imposed on the material of popular life. This is like Pushkin. And he imagines a future literature of the majority, but this literature won't be composed of folk forms. So the work of a romantic like folk poet like Tetsov is too particular. And he's imagining instead something that's synthesizing the particular with the universal, but emerging out of popular life. It doesn't seem to exist. It's what he hopes there will be. Um, there's some more insight onto what Dobrolyubov imagines in a very short essay that he has on the poetry of Taras Shevchenko. And here he writes that he's going to set aside the ongoing contemporary argument about whether the little Russian language, as Ukrainian is called, is capable of producing literature because he says the Ukrainian language would have to absorb so many borrowers to speak about literary topics that would no longer be Ukrainian, while the Russian language, on the other hand, is already composed of so many borrowers that it has lost its Russianness. So this question is, is really moot, and there's an interesting, you know, what language exactly does literature, is literature written in, is the remaining question. Um, question I, I don't have an answer to, but um, this is another way of posing this distance between the bookish forms of Pushkin impo imposed on popular life versus the folk poetry of Hatsov or Shevchenko in Devdadubov's view. Um, so in his formulation, these particular national qualities, including the particularities of languages themselves, will be shed on the path towards this universal idea of narodnost that should emerge from that pre-existing popularity, particularity and difference. So if we go back to the invocation of Rus um, by Nikrasov's character, Dabrasklonov, we can see that the folk hero's poetic image of the barge haulers rendered as a symbol of the Russian nation might be striving for that kind of universality that Dabrasklonov imagined. Maybe in some way, Nikrasov is trying to fulfill that idea of, of uh, literature, of narodnost. Um, that's a civic rather than ethnic belonging that transcends class through this poet um, character that's also a kind of echo of Dabrodubov himself. But the bar teller status as the representative of civic Russian national belonging is, is realized again through the seminarian observer's poetic song. And that figure binds together the reader and the poet and the narod. So now I'm going to look at how Reshetnikov is also engaging Dobralyubov's notion of civic narodnost that emerges from popular life. Um, but his collective is different from Nekrasov's because of the difference between his narrating persona and that of uh, the folk hero Dobrasoloma. So looking at Reshetnikov's proletarianization plot, Hadipovtsi from 1864, his first um, important work. This focuses on Komi peasants from Perm province. Um, and it's one of the first works to situate itself as a part of literature about peasants who are not Russian and not Ukrainian. I have this on the authority of Alexei Dovin, who read everything written about peasants until 1861 and probably a lot of what was written about peasants after that. Um, but that this really was a uh, distinct work in being a, a part of the literature of peasants that is not about Russian peasants. So Reshetnikov's Komi peasants become barge haulers, and the well, the two protagonists, Pila and Sisoko, die on the barges. There's a younger generation. They have Russian names, Pavel and Ivan. They find work on a steamship. They learn to read um, and they essentially become Russian. So this is a kind of proletarianization plot that's also a plot of Russian acculturation. And some other examples, this is a short story, Yashka, it's quite a long short story from 1868 about a baby born in St. Petersburg to a mother and father who come from a village nearby. These are ethnic Russian peasants. They come to the city and it shows, narrates basically the slow destruction of this family unit. Um, as they navigate their lives in the city. And then where is it better? Gadiel Lutsha follows a group of old believer peasants from a factory settlement in the Urals who go looking for someplace better and they're dispersed and propelled across Russia and they all eventually end up in St. Petersburg. 
Um, so there are other examples, but these are a few important works of Reshevnikov's, and each of these plots is driven by this struggle to survive, which sends protagonists on journeys that integrate diverse spheres of life in the Russian Empire, and they separate them from their homes and family members. So in a sense, these depictions literalize Dabradyubov's vision of the emergence of a narodnost that transcends national particularity, but is still Russian. This plot of dispersion develops a new collective whose members have shed their particularity through shared material struggle, and it sews together this vast imperial geography and diverse peoples. So as a narrative of kind of encroaching modernity, the proletarianization plot is also a narrative of russification in some cases. Roshetnikov's collective doesn't include his reader as Nekrasov's does because Roshetnikov's authorial perspective was situated in and among the proletarianizing peasants themselves. And in many cases, he was writing about certain experiences that he shared, especially when he's writing about, um, about peasants in the city. But this embedded perspective also establishes some limits around his proletarianizing collective. He can only tell the story of the people with whom he is able to identify and occupy this particular authorial position with. So he described his way of understanding himself as an author in his own terms in a way that I think is very evocative. This is a quote from when he was 19 and he, he was, wrote this in a letter to his uncle and he's just kind of dreaming about becoming a professional writer at this time. He wrote, so this perspective of the poor man in the crowd of the human world, I think quite effectively describes how Reshetnikov understood himself as a writer and also how he actually went about his practice of gathering the information that he would use to, he didn't write nonfiction, but he, you know, he wrote from material that he gathered from life. Um, and his archive is full of notes documenting eavesdropped conversations in taverns and the details of his neighbor's finances and personal relationships. And it, it, there's, it's clear that he's really paying attention, especially to how people conduct their lives materially, how much they're paying for their apartment, how much they spend on food, these kinds of things, how people are actually managing to get by. And those kinds of details are in his work. And in a lot of ways, they make up the kind of material of the plots of his work um, in a way that's interesting. Um, so you can gain some insight into Reshetnikov's authorial identity by comparing him briefly to a different model of a realist author, um, Tolstoy. <laughs> so Reshetnikov, like Tolstoy, is writing in most cases from an omniscient third person perspective but rather than having this kind of synthesizing view, he's really embedded um, in a view that's attached to the view of his characters. Um, and if we think of Tolstoy as being celebrated for his ability to render the particular universal, for instance, developing his narrating voice by writing a version of his own noble childhood that, as scholars have argued, comes to represent the Russian childhood as such, um, then Ryshetnikov does something different. Although he's depicting experiences that were shared, obviously, by many more people than the kind of childhood that Tolstoy experienced, he's not writing things that seem as though they could belong to anyone. They're not meant to be universal, necessarily. So this is an example of his narrating perspective. This is from Palipovtsi. Um, the protagonists have just awoken in jail after going to the city, and they... Uh, spent the evening in the taverns, they fell asleep in the middle of the street and then they're taken to jail. They're not really in trouble, they're gonna be let out, they're just being held there because they were asleep in the middle of the street. So um, we're seeing with their eyes as they figure out where they are. Pila isi soiko nikak ni mungri panyat, idea ni ishto eta za yudi pakia. Pomite ni ishto bili v kabakia, a kak si da zabradis, a ni da že strusili, so Reshevnikov keeps his reader's view attached to that of his characters. We're figuring things out as, as they do, 
their perspective is also very particular. Waking up in jail, they imagine that they may have awoken in that other world, maybe hell, which might as well be barge hauling. It's so far away from life in their home village. So Rishenkov's authorial persona within and outside of his writing is based on identification with his subjects. And that identification allowed him to collect observations that he includes in his stories, um, the kinds of particular details of everyday life that not everyone would have had access to. And he also depicts this perspective in his stories in the way that he aligns his narrating view with that of his characters. But his relationship with his subjects also shifted depending on the context in which he was working. So when he wrote about um, ethnic Komi peasants in Perm, he was their representative to the intellectual world of the capital, even though he wasn't Komi himself. Um, and when he wrote about urban workers, he wrote about experiences that he shared as a poor provincial who moved to the city. And when he was writing about Jews in the Pale, he was no longer a poor man who could disappear in the crowd. He was a Russian in Russian-occupied territory, so he was really a settler. So now I'll give some background on how these sketches came about. Roshenkov moved with his family to Brest-Litovsk Brest in 1867. Um, the city on the border of uh, what were called the interior provinces and the occupied kingdom of Poland. They moved there um, because his wife was assigned to work as a midwife in a military hospital. So this was just a economically required move. Uh, 1867 was very soon after the 1866 Polish uprising. There is a huge military presence. This is a city with a large Russian fortress. Um, and there were a lot of there's also a railroad being built. There are a lot of Russians coming from the capitals at that time to this area. Um, and it was a pretty alienating environment for a literary author from St. Petersburg to be living. And Rashevnikov really took on the project of writing about the Jews in Brest as essentially the only other civilians around. At some point he writes in his diary that I walk around and the only people I see who aren't wearing military uniforms are the Jews. And his notes suggest that he's approaching a study of Jewish people in search of the same kind of story that he's looking for elsewhere, this story of proletarianization. In the first sketch he wrote, he writes um, that he observes that poor Jews are driven to leave to Warsaw or Petersburg or to disperse across Russia. So he's identifying the phenomenon that he's interested in elsewhere happening here, although there's, of course, complexities for Jews to move uh, across the empire and confined to the pale. But, um, and then the most substantial work about Jews that he completed was a sketch called Work in Rest Days of Janko Dvorkin and his family, Budni Praznik Janko Dvorkina i Vosinistva. So this is a pretty long fictional narrative that centers on the wealthy Dvorkin family. And there's a tragic heroine of the narrative that is the most downtrodden among its characters and that's the Dvorkin servant, Leia. So she is their kind of proletarian heroine in this story. And when she is about to leave the Dworkin family and to begin what in other stories of Roshetnikov would be this common proletarian struggle, um, instead she commits suicide. So she's effectively cut out of that narrative. So why? According to his own account, Roshetnikov struggled to find a way into writing about Jewish society. He couldn't occupy this position of the invisible poor man in the crowd that he occupied elsewhere. And in this first sketch that he wrote overnight in a Jewish city, there's some dramatization of what was going on. Um, it's also, I think, interestingly illustrates how he was kind of went about his information gathering as a writer. So he's uh, peppering the owner of a hotel. This is the narrator of this sketch, which is written as he was traveling to Brest for the first time. Um, so it's fictionalized, but it's essentially a kind of description of his experience traveling to Brest. And he's, he's peppering the owner of the hotel where he's staying with questions. Um, and he's waiting for a samovar. Мне хотелось узнать, что это за господин хозяин. Но при каждом моем вопросе, касающемся его хозяйства, он уходил в кухню и кричал самовар. 
Я только и узнал, и узнал, что он купец первой гильдии, что дом ему стоит 40 тысяч, и что в Петербурге он жил много лет. I think it seems as though he's already found out a decent amount of personal mm -hmm. information about his um, host, despite his clear uh, disinterest in speaking with him. Um, and as, as this conversation goes on, they talk more about things going on in general, all of the young people coming from the capitals to this area, and it's clear that the person that he's speaking to doesn't want to talk to him and associates him with these people who are coming in and doing unclear what exactly. Um, so Reshetnikov's status as a Russian in Brest, which is occupied by the Russian military, combined with his particular understanding of himself as an author um, who is writing from a perspective of identification really makes it difficult for him to learn about the people that he is living among um, and to write about them as he is used to. He eventually completed his story, Yanka Dvorkin, but he was really unsatisfied with the work. And it, when it was published, it drew criticism for obvious inaccuracies about Jewish life. It seems as though he took a lot of material to kind of fill in what he wasn't able to actually learn from published sources, which had very questionable facts. And, and there were a lot of published, you know, um, studies of ethnographies of Jewish life that had just made up things in them. So those kinds of um, uh, inaccuracies show up in his sketches as well. And it's easy to see why he wasn't happy with this story. It, it has the factual inaccuracies, but it's also just different texturally from others of his work. This intimate narrating perspective that he establishes in Hadithokti is absent. He's at a distance from his subjects. This is just a short um, excerpt. Yanka prayezdil troye sutok v srcah v derevnyah. V njivo bolo mnogo dažnikov. On so graziti nastrašal bjednih ptak, što ani za uplatili im v dolg mukoj, kakru ju tojka magli sabrat. So, with a literally external view, we have no sense of Yanka's subjective experience and also his actions conform to the stereotypical image of a capitalist Jew who's exploiting innocent peasants. And Roshenikov describes himself really how he got to this depiction. He writes, so he's stuck outside of Jewish society, and he's also challenged by the class division that he sees within Jewish society and within the pale more broadly. He wanted to pick Jewish proletarian struggle, but instead he writes about Jewish capitalists. Leah, Reshetnikov's positive hero in Yanku, is the most downtrodden figure that he has. She is literally described as a slave, um, but her suicide powerfully distinguishes her from others of Roshetnikov's heroes and heroines. So rather than being incorporated into this proletarianized mass, she's separated. And her suicide has literary precedence with significance for the radical literary milieu. It recalls the suicide of Katerina, the heroine of uh, Nikolai, uh, not everyone's name, Nikolai, Alexander Ostrovsky's 1859 play, The Storm, Graza. So the storm depicts life within the merchant caste in a fictional location along the Volga River. And in Dabra Lyubov's uh, influential essay on the storm, um, he highlights Katerina's suicide as a powerful act of individual will in protest to an unacceptable but inescapable reality. So he writes that Katerina is a product of her milieu, um, which Ostrovsky depicts as backward, patriarchal, and penetrable. And he writes that Katerina was, quote, raised with understandings identical to those of the milieu in which she lives, and she cannot refute them as she has no theoretical education. Nonetheless, she has an organic Russian living nature, natura, which stirs within her the demand of the emerging movement of Russian life, as he puts it. But because she's locked materially and in terms of her worldview within this milieu, this demand cannot be fulfilled and her only escape is death. 
So Reshetnikov would have been familiar with this essay, and his depiction of Jewish society shares quite a bit with Ostrovsky's depiction of the merchantry. He's showing a closed society governed by tyrannical patriarchs like Yanke Dvorkin. And Leia's suicide, like Katarina's, is also rendered as an act of existential protest. She has a living nature that cannot abide her oppression. She can't escape, so she commits suicide. So Leia's story clearly reflects the Bradyubov's interpretation of the storm, um, which helps to see how differently Roshanka writes about Jews than about other populations, especially because this is not the only moment of intertext with the storm in his work of the same period. In Where Is It Better, which was also published in 1868, he explicitly contrasts the fate of his heroine, Pidigia Makranosova, to that of Katerina in Roshanka is a storm. So after a long and arduous struggle at the end of a 400 plus page novel, Perigea has finally found a stable living and working arrangement. Um, and she celebrates by going to see Ostrowski's play, Storm. And after this, the moment when things have finally gotten better for Perigea, she gets a sore throat after drinking some cold water and she dies and the novel ends. <laughs> and it's, it often happens that people get sore throats in this novel and they die very soon afterwards. So whenever somebody has a you know lump in their throat, it's very uh, portentous. <laughs> so her death is a shock because the reader has seen her survive for so long. Um, but it's also unremarkable. It echoes many other sudden painful, banal, expected deaths that have occurred throughout the novel. And it's explicitly contrasted with the death of Katerina that she witnesses on the stage before falling ill. Um, her death links her to her friends and family and all of those who suffered similar, a similar fate. And she never stops trying to survive. All of them are part of this shared proletarian struggle while Katerina, um, Leia that is, like Katerina asserts in her death, her organic indiv individuality, her living Russian nature perhaps we could say, which underscores the separation of her society from that of the broader Russian empire, like, like in the storm. So Roshetnikov can't write about the world of the Jews from an internal perspective, because on the one hand, he's a settler in colonized territory. He can't disappear within Jewish society. On the other hand, his search for narratives of proletarianization leads him to depict Jewish capitalists as villains through these familiar anti-Semitic tropes, and he deals with all of this narratively through Leia's suicide, which aligns her with Katerina from the storm and the juice in the play in the pale with Ostrowski's enclosed world of the merchantry. So as I come to my conclusion, I'd just like to quickly pose Rzhitnikov's work next to depictions of imperial diversity and Jews specifically by Dostoevsky and Yuskov. And I'm speaking of this from a quite general perspective, drawing from Gabriela Safran's study of narratives of Jewish acculturation, rewriting the Jew, and M. Lounsbury's study of the provinces, representation of the provinces, life is elsewhere. Um, so Safran poses Neskov's notion of nationality against Dostoevsky's, and she describes Neskov's stories based on their depictions of Jews. So I'm not going into details here, but she describes Neskov's stories as parables that highlight and preserve idiosyncrasy and difference, while Dostoevsky's iconic narratives center the messianic promise of Russian Orthodox Christianity. And in Dostoevsky's work, that messianic mission of the ethnic Russian nation is prophesied by the visionary author, and Yeskov's Russian nation is one among many in an ideal of flourishing difference that's captured by this rambling collector of imperial oddities. And Lounsbury describes these goals versus Dostoevsky's depictions of the provinces in terms that parallel saffron's that this goals work sidesteps the typical capital versus provinces binary by focusing on the particularities of diverse lo locales, so that this goals in uh, Anne's terms constructs a network within which there's no hub. And instead, Dostoevsky's interest in the provinces is rooted in his view of the always existing unity of the Russian people. So as he says in Notes from the House of the Dead, a peasant from Taganrog could move to Petropavlovsk and would immediately be perfectly at home, although these places are thousands of miles apart because of the inherent unity of the Russian people. And then the capital, the capital can capture and refract that always existing unity under certain circumstances. 
So Dershevnikov's depiction shares something with both Dostoevsky's and Yeskov's images of the nation and differs from both. As in Dostoevsky's representation, the capital is central, but its centrality is material rather than spiritual. Its pull is economic. And as in Yeskov's work, Bereshchenikov's peasants are diverse, but as they migrate to the capitals, their differences disappear. They don't exist in a traditional world that's preserved in all of its particularity. And unlike Lyeskov or Dostoevsky, Ereshchenkov writes from the perspective of one who shares in his subject's struggles, not as a documentary collector or as a prophet. But when he travels to occupy Poland so his wife can work in a military hospital, he turns from revealing the reality of proletarian struggle in ways that it really hadn't been seen in literature before to reproducing anti-Semitic tropes. Um, so to conclude, I'll return to Dabragyubov's notion of narodnost and Nekrasov's image um, of Rus in the poetry of his folk hero, Dabrasplonov. So in Dabra Yubov's essay, we can broadly define the notion of nationality in the radical camp in the reform era. In contrast to Dostoevsky, Dabra Yubov doesn't articulate pre-existing ethnic unity to be accessed by intellectuals, but a shared egalitarian, but Russophone modernity that will eventually emerge. Nakraso's later text um, offers a populist reformulation of this notion of narodnost, where the collective labor of the barge haulers offers the image of a modern nation to come. And the image of all powerful Rus is channeled by the mediating ex seminarian in a way that links the poet and the people and the reader. But Ashutnikov presents, presents a version of Dabradyubov's notion of the Russian Empire as a Russophone collective of modern subjects when his characters in Padlipovtsi lose the markers of their ethnic difference. Mm -hmm. But while Nekrasov's populist hero offers the static image of the barge hauler, Ashutnikov is interested in the narrative of becoming a barge hauler. His characters are linked by their shared material struggle, and his collective can't include the reader who hasn't shared in that process. This notion of collectivity is reflected in the authorial paradigm that Urshanikov and his fellow writers from the people occupied, which was based on their shared experience rather than shared nationality. But Urshanikov's inability to write about Jews and the way that he writes about Petersburg workers and Komi peasants leads him to particularize Leia's struggle so that the Pale of Settlement is cut out of a Russian empire that's sewn together by this proletarian on the move. So in he, his ethnographic fictions, I think we can recognize, on the one hand, a legitimate effort to seek out the experiences of the common people outside of the confines of ethnic and confessional boundaries. Um, he shows an imperial collective that's not defined by belonging to a Russian nation, but instead by the precarious alliances of itinerant laborers. Um, but his Jewish sketches also shed light on the limitations of a notion of class solidarity that's not considering national and ethnic difference in a polity that's structured by ethnic hierarchies. And we have questions from the audience, uh, Rosson, and then Ed, please Rosson. Um, so my question is going to the depths of my ignorance. Oh. I'm very interested in this very interesting view, but um, uh, on, the, on the question of uh, authorship, I was wondering whether um, whether Gorky would be granted, you know, with this part that I think uh, probably two, two decades after mm -hmm. Rishetnikov's death uh, would be an interesting model because his appearance caused a sensation among uh, among queer uh, writers, partly because of the low origins, mm -hmm. uh, his own low origins, um, combined with a very heavily ethnographic uh, fiction based on. Uh, or partly autobiographical fiction, and then um, and granted, you know, the, the, the notions of the popular and the national have evolved in those mm -hmm. 20 years, but uh, I'm wondering whether you've seen any parallels, and, and more broadly, um, could you tell us a little bit more about Reshetnikov's uh, reception among his broader, broader circles of you know, contemporaries? Mm -hmm. And uh, whether the populist movement uh, um, 
you know, in any way, engaged with the writing. Mm -hmm. So I'll just go question first. Yeah. Um, so Gorky, I think it's an interesting question that I have thought about that Gorky would himself, I think, wanted to be more like Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, but from a low origin, like these writers that are Shetnikov or Pomilovsky, uh, Uspinsky, he mentions them a few times in, I can't remember what writing, but, um, and his work is definitely coming out of that tradition that they are a part of, but I think that Gorky at least thought of himself as kind of doing something that was less particular, I guess, than what they were doing, um, which I think goes nicely into Roshetnikov's contemporary reception that um, he was really written about by his contemporaries as a writer who kind of, um, and not, not only Roshetnikov, but maybe Roshetnikov more than anybody else, didn't, um, didn't really like write. Like he was channeling experience that he had access to um, that others didn't. And he wasn't really crafting that experience in a literary way. He was um, just reporting. reporting it, yes. Um, and so there's, there's some interesting ways of describing him that I have in other parts of my my work, but as really this kind of, um, like I think Skabichevsky describes him as an inarodits, a vlichadits is uh, the, from the Bashkir steppe. And also like the Finnish grandson of nature, so he is like every Russian, every imperial minority at once. Um, although he was Russian, um, ethnic Russian, as far as I've ever been able to gather. So, um, so I mean, people were really interested in his work. And uh, Yidya Lucha, I think especially, I mean, I think it's a really amazing novel and, um, and it, People, Saltikov Shudrin wrote about it. He thought it was kind of this totally new way of depicting the people. But there's always that uh, element in the writing about him in the 1860s, 1870s that's like, but he wasn't really like a real writer. And so I think Gorky took that model to some extent, but he was made sure that nobody talked about him like he wasn't a real writer. Um, but Roshetnikov's work was read, like um, it's on the list in, in um, the lists of, of literature that the populace were reading or handing out. It's odd to think of Pagivov's even given to peasants to read, I guess. But at least the populace were reading it themselves as a way of learning about the peasantry. So it was um, kind of a part of that canon. Yeah. Um, first of all, not only fantastic talk, but in my opinion, a fantastic opening into a new future, like lines of inquiry for us at this moment of, uh, I think we can say crisis in the field. This is super productive. And um, uh, I have a question actually about Dostoevsky, which is weird because I never think about Dostoevsky, <laughs> but um, you, in the, the quote, I took a, I took a screenshot, uh, when Rishenko writes in the letter, no one sees the poor man, but he from Mountain Vantage sees everything in the world, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So this, this is, to me, what Dostoevsky seems to be trying to imagine in poor people and those from the ground, yeah. but in a very sort of strenuous way, because we know he's not really that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, he's, he's a nobleman who's to some degree in an unstable way, mm -hmm. but kind of imagining himself in that position. Yeah. So my first question would you do you think that's accurate? And my second question is just please remind me because the point you just made about Gorky carefully positioning himself so he does not become a Rishnikov. I have some uh, theoretical reading about that, mm -hmm. uh, not about Russian literature, but that was very helpful to me mm -hmm. in trying to 
uh, think about how how writers in that position manage to try to control how they were treated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I will ask you for that. Um, and yes, I think that like in thinking about the comparison of Roshanikov to Tolstoy, I thought that it doesn't work as well to compare him to Dostoevsky in terms of contrasting these views because the way that he writes is a lot more like how Dostoevsky writes. Um, and I think Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky saw that himself. He does mention Roshanikov in the place where he talks about how he wants to write against landlord literature. So I think it's in a letter, but where that quote comes from, he's talking about all the Roshetnikovs, as he calls them, um, and um, kind of recognizing that what those writers are doing, and Roshetnikov in particular, was like what he wanted to do, but without the view of, you know, the kind of eschatological undercurrent, right, without the presence of this um, Kind of view of transcendence that, that Dostoevsky is also trying to hold in view. So I think his work is definitely connected to these writers. Thank you. Please. So uh, I did not read the original text, so it will be largely based on your presentation. It looks like uh, the active dimension is much more salient, much more important for the author than the non dimension. So my question is, was it his personal perception or was was there some sort of like historical reality in which he was operating that made this ethnic dimension more important than like proletarian dimension? The ethnic dimension yeah. for Vershetnikov. Yeah. Well, I don't think, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to look at is exactly that question um, where, because really that's, why these Jewish sketches are so kind of different from other works of his. So when he writes about these Komi peasants, um, these are ethnic minorities. They are different kind of ethnic minority than Jews um, for a whole variety of reasons. And in this 19th century context, they're an ethnic minority that's more easily imagined on essentially a teleological path towards Russianness. Um, and were written about that uh, in that way in um, in in journalism of the period. Um, but when he writes this sketch about Yankee Vorkin and his family, he really closes off this world of the Jews that he's writing about um, in a way that he doesn't in writing about any other kind of context. I mean, because his narratives are so much about movement, it's like none of his characters can ever stay anywhere for very long because they're always trying to find some other better situation. Um, and they're often in the kind of position that Katharina, uh, not Katharina, but Leia is in, in the Yagud Vorkin story where they're working for a family who maybe treats them not very well. But then they leave and they find some other thing to do and nothing ever gets better, but they're always moving. And so there's not this like hard line around wherever they are that cuts it off completely from everywhere else, um, which is the way that he depicts this situation for Leia in the Yankut Vorkin family. So, I mean, I think that the socioeconomic part was the thing that he was most interested in. It's the thing that he's always looking at. And it's the thing that he's asking questions about when he first arrives in Brest-Litovsk. He's like his, uh, uh, you know, hotel owner and he's like already knows how much he paid for his house. And um, he's, you know, looking at all of these economic relationships, but he kind of I mean, it seems like his one, he's just seeing like it seems like his depiction is just like invaded by all of these existing depictions of Jews. And so that you find these kind of representations that are just extremely familiar. Or in his other works, part of what's so interesting about them is that they're just 
when I read Gidea Lucha, there's things there that I've never ever seen or or had any idea of having access to like this sphere of experience like what is happening at a salt refinery in the urals and how does the kind of social organization there work and who gets to do what jobs and like all of the kind of plot comes out of that process whereas in this Janke Dvorkin sketch it's like all just kind of you know almost like set descriptions that are coming from existing ethnographic de depictions of Jewish people in space um, except a little bit in the depiction of this character, Leia, who is the character that he's clearly the most interested in. Um, but then her story is really like truncated. Oh, well, this Please. is a very, very, it's not even a question, it's comment about roads and movement. Mm. If you wanted um, a sort of comparative component, you could think about um, uh, Roads full of displaced proletarians and authors like Hardy, mm -hmm. um, Chekhov, Steinbeck, yeah. right? These, yeah. these proletarianization that involves wandering. Um, and it's super interesting that the Jewish example is like at this at this historical moment kind of closed off from mm -hmm. wandering. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, that novel is very much part of that. Next time. Yeah, tradition. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, from Simone Forster. Uh, Simone, please. Helen, hello. Great to see you there. <laughs> um, of all places. I wondered whether you could say a few words about how you teach Reshetnikov. Mm. <laughs> wow. Well, it would be my dream to teach Reshetnikov. Um, and but, well, it would require having his work be translated, unless I could teach it in English. Um, I, the work that I would most love to teach is Where Is It Better, which is a kind of impractical um, thing to imagine in a number of ways. One, because it's quite long, and two, well, because it's long, so translating it is a long-term project that if I were to do it, it would have been here for quite a while. And uh, also, you know, it's hard to fit long novels into syllabi. But I think that, you know, I'm teaching 19th century survey right now. And um, I think the students are really attuned to how limited the perspective of the authors that they're reading in that kind of course is. And I, I feel a kind of desire to have some access to some other kind of perspective stories from other spheres of life. Um, and so I think that, you know, to teach like crime and punishment, where is it better and Anna Karenina would be mm -hmm. incredible. Mm -hmm. I think it would be so interesting um, to see those three big novels together. Um, and, and then that, you know, question of Rishetnikov's relationship with the Fagisky versus Tolstoy, we could really um, think about that and think about what kind of a novel um, Where Is It Better is, because it's also formally, it's kind of like a long chain of sketches of all of these different places that these traveling peasants are um, going to. So, um, yes, I mean, teaching uh, undergraduate literature and translation courses on the 19th century is kind of frustrating sometimes because of how limited the material that we have access to in translation is. So just put that out at any opportunity. <laughs> um, but Rishabhikov is a pretty distinctive figure even among the other writers who were similar to him, like Pomilovsky, Edivitov, Uspensky, who all came from the priesthood, and Rishetnikov's background is even kind of more obscure than theirs, and his writing is like more panoramic and has much more variety of life worlds in it. Um, so I think he is really someone who we could be reading and talking about more, both in classes and outside. Yeah, thank you. I um, I have a couple of questions that I will try to uh, to to formulate. One is one has to do with this concept of struggle, which mm -hmm. you have mentioned a couple of times. 
and it struck me that struggle has these two dimensions, right? The struggle as in, you know, a kind of suffering, yeah. uh, struggling to survive, and the struggle that is a fighting, right? Which <clears throat> actually makes me think, of course, of, 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 of Gorky, uh, right? As, a, as, as somebody who is very interested in the second kind of struggle, um, and I'm wondering if you find in the Shetnikov um, that dimension, right, where people are uh, actually struggling in a in a sort of agential way that um, you know, sort of consciously attempting to change their uh, their situation and the situation of of others like them, mm -hmm. and then that has to do for me with with a couple of kind of side. Uh, Questions. One of one of which is, of course, the question of this, um, of of voice and agency, right? And the relationship between voice and, and agency as or voice as a as a form of representation of agency, um, where, like, <clears throat> you know what, you know, because my 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 reading. Rishetnikov is unfortunately also limited to sections of где um, лучше, and uh, and so I don't and I don't recall instances of this, but I do wonder to what extent, again, by comparison to someone like Gorky, to what extent you get this kind of Bildungsroman uh, uh, like mm -hmm. a developmental trajectory uh, anywhere in mm -hmm. in 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 these. Uh, in these texts among the the poorer people. And and then, you know, this then touch goes back to Leah, the, the question of Leah, because what we have in the in the case of the of of, of the, the Jewish situation, right, we seem to have an in, from your description again, unfamiliar, the depths of ignorance, um frightening the, the the, the, the we have the um, failed sort of stereotyped representation of the of the bourgeois Jew, mm -hmm. but then again, you know, we don't really get, as I understand it, in the of that much interest in sort of bourgeois um, subjectivity, right? Mm -hmm. There's interest in pro, right, and mm -hmm. insofar as so, then one would look at Leia. Right. right, and one would be like, well, what, what's her subjectivity like? Is that somehow more uh, authentic, more believable? Um, or is that based, do you find that that's based on the sort of non-Jewish proletarian voices or, or close to those voices? Uh, is there, a, a, does she represent anything specifically Jewish proletarian? So yeah, yeah. so that kind of interest in Leia as well, and uh, these questions are all related in a way that's obscure to me. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to uh, answer them in uh, as if they're related. Okay, just whatever comes to mind. Yes, thank you. Those are all really, really uh, good questions that help me, you know, help me think through the material myself. Um, so, first on the question of fighting and agency and the attempt to change the situation. There is some of that in Where Is It Better? Because um, it's like there's enough time for that kind of part of the narrative to come through in a sense. Um, like Yashka is a really just completely like miserable story. This little boy's mother at some point loses her hands and she continues. So she's so she goes from being like a worker to basically to being a Nishi because she uh, can't work anymore and she continues to, but she, that's where the struggle to survive, like she keeps trying to survive, you know, and she gets various people to help her. She finds kind of various living situations where she's able to be like fed and housed. Um, but uh that's a story that really like in the end Yashka is in prison and it's just this kind of like this is how the city just like grinds people to you know mm -hmm. um whereas it better has much more space for its characters to create sustainable circumstances for themselves and um so towards the end Leia ha not sorry I'm confusing mm -hmm. everybody's name is pretty Gaya. 
she has met this uh, man who lives in St. Petersburg and he is like a carpenter. And together they have kind of come up with a artisan, uh, like she's working as a laundry. Uh, she's doing laundry, he's doing carpentry. They've found a place where they can live together. So it almost looks like they're going to have this like bourgeois family life uh, where they have their own apartment, just the two of them. And they are both working in a way that's sustainable. And he is working on creating a um, like carpenters collective. So there's also that element, like the, the Soviet scholar who worked on Urshavnikov Ivan Vexler, who's I will be forever indebted to because he had put together a really fantastic collected works of Rashidikov with a lot of commentary and his, his reading of this ending of the um, of the novel is that like the beginning of an actual proletarian consciousness is in this character Petrov who is trying to organize the workers. And, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that was the way things were tended to be read at that time, but I don't think it's necessarily wrong mm -hmm. either. Um, it's from like the 30s, it's from that edition. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but then Pity Gay dies and everything is tragic. But there is some, um, you know, there are these new familial and social bonds that are formed in the city that create some possibility for um, um, improving one's conditions and not just. Mm -hmm. continuing to go downhill and there's there's like other families that they you know there's all this there's a lot so, of sort of mutual aid style yeah. fighting that, that yes like, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um i don't think that there's really like a bildungsroman kind of development um there's the material process of just finding ways to live is kind of the substance of the plot um, in Where Is It Better and in, and in other works as well. Maybe just in tiny ways where like this ending of Padipovci where the Ivan and Pavel are like very happy on a steamship eating fruit and reading Russian is very also very out of character actually for Russian house workers generally and it's very sadly. Um, but that has a little bit of that, you know, they they have this kind of very sped up building where they're like, what is going on in this world? And, you know, they've never been out of their home village and they're like 12 and then all of a sudden they are kind of settling into life among the workers and some shit. And then Leia, this is a, a really interesting question um, because I think that, so there's all these things where, like she throws herself into mysticism. That's something that mm -hmm. happens. Um, and I think that is a way that her, that Roshnikov is imagining her particular Jewish experience of the being, you know, a, an oppressed subject in this family, um, that she's trying to, as she's trying to imagine her way out, one of the things she does is throw herself into mysticism. I have it quote somewhere, but I can't. Um, remember exactly what it is. Um, but then also there's this, you know, when she's imagining like what what would happen if I left, um, it's said that she would be rejected by the Jews and the Christians. So she's kind of like trapped mm -hmm. because she's Jewish. And in that sense, it's almost like she's, you know, she could be a proletarian, but she's kind of oppressed by her Jewishness. Mm -hmm. And it does read in that way to a certain extent. Like if she could just escape being Jewish, she could join the proletarian struggle, which is not good, but at least there you keep fighting, you know, you keep trying to find some place to be. And there's a freedom in that. And that is something that comes up even in Yashka, like, the mother who loses her hands doesn't want to go to uh, like a poorhouse because it's essentially like being, you know, having no agency over your life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is that idea that if you're out and you're finding your daily bread, that's better than being confined somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, yeah, complicated. 
Yeah. I, in the Padilla book too, mm -hmm. and I, I'm not, I don't think we even read any of that in um, I don't the other think activity, so. right? So that means I've never read it. Yeah. And I wasn't aware of the communists of mm, yes. people. And so I, since I haven't read it, I don't know how that's represented. But um, given the current interest in sort of indigenous writers and literatures, mm -hmm. is this, then this is a question from ignorance, can this proletarianization narrative be read as a sort of anti-indigenization narrative? You know what I mean? Like, is it is it becoming unindigenous? I think in this, in the case of the this Komi, like in in Padipoti, it is. Okay. Yeah, that and with the Jews, in a sense, if you think of yeah. them in that way. Yeah, that there's it's like the the coming out into you know joining this kind of moving mass is also it's leaving that traditional world of the peasantry, and in the case of um, I mean, this is how it looks to me looking at these texts. That in the case of uh, of uh, of non Russian peasants or or non peasants, but non Russian peoples of the empire, it's also leaving that culture. So um, the yeah, and the 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 like village that the Padipotsi live in is completely. Like there's just no, nothing grows there. There's no food, you know, there's no kind of life there. So there's no um, real depiction of a kind of culture that is being lost. Yeah. Oh, yeah, please. Sorry, just one quick thing, but there's an interesting um, in, uh, Kraflikin's History of Russian Literature. He mm -hmm. talks about this text and he says that Rashenikov depicts peasants who are not quite yet Russian. So that's the kind of way that I think that um, the communists is depicted right there and also was talked about and imagined in the press in that time. In that sense, um, I'm thinking about a writer who, who was sometimes referred to as a regionalist, Noam Kipchevsky. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it seems like um, Rishetnikov in some ways could be thought of as the opposite of a regionalist. Yeah. Okay. And and Noam Kipchevsky's regionalism relies on the pastness of what he's describing. It's like closed off. It's not going anywhere. Maybe it was cute or whatever. Mm -hmm. And is it is it accurate to say that Shetnikov is really not a regionalist? He sort of like pops into these places. Yes, I mean he's the particularities that he's interested in are like work, workspace. You know what is going on at the um, at the, the salt refinery? How do two women find a way to keep each other afloat by working as laundresses in a regional city? Right, so that's why I think, you know, like to thinking about him in terms of proletarianization is like really the way that makes sense to think about it because he really, it's like they're, his characters are kind of in this work world and that's what is being depicted in so much more detail than you find in most other works. But the cultural particularity is almost completely absent. Um, which is why then his Jewish sketches are really striking. And it seems like he's like wanted to do something else, but there was too much particularity for him to kind of grapple with. And also he didn't have, you know, he, he never found any informants who could tell him things that would allow him to put real details in. So I had a question also, Liz. Yeah. Um, I had a question that I, I'm not sure maybe a little bit too too broad, but I just was very intrigued by um, the quote that you brought um, brought up by Rishetnikov, where he is basically saying something like, "As a poor person, I am um, I am an, an invisible seer, right? Or something like this, right? I'm somebody who is invisible, and yet I see kind of everything, and I judge everything." And this point of invisibility, 
from which the narration unfolds mm -hmm. is curiously, uh, well, it's obviously reminiscent of omniscience, which is such yeah. a huge kind of formal development device of, of what we are usually associated with the, with the bourgeois novel, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and a kind of bourgeois subjectivity that is capable of, uh, right, that is not seen, right, not judged, but is judging, is seeing, is sort of um, has acquired all of these capacities to govern themselves and um, to understand the whole and so on. And so I guess I'm curious about what, what happens when you when you take that point of invisible um, surveillance, right, or, or invisible seeing, and you replace and you and you think of that person as somebody who's actually a poor person, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody who's actually a proletarian. Proletarian. What what changes, if anything? Um, about, do we have a different model of universality here, and what is it? And I understand that these are these are maybe too too abstract um, or too broad, but it makes me think of uh, once again Gorky, <laughs> uh, right? Because he's such a good kind of counterpart to this, in which where right the, the 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 traditional bourgeois form of the Bildungsroman is so useful for him, uh, and he's you know in a way a traditionalist, right? Mm -hmm. right? He's he's extremely. Um, Classical, right? And in the yeah. way in which he wants also mm -hmm. to be perceived. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and so is his work with perspective. Um, so I guess what I'm curious about is, and, and this, you mentioned this um, this publication by, I forget the Soviet scholar's name that you mentioned, that uh, yeah. takes place in the 30s, early. Or late or um it starts i think in the like mid 30s right yeah right. and then it finishes after the war like the right. publication right of the works yeah because it's a curious moment also and i will defer to to rosen having to do with this whole debate about proletarian culture yeah. versus universal culture right and the the, the universal being bourgeois right mm -hmm. in a way like conflated back with the bourgeois and so the 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 idea that you would publish somebody in the third, right, that you would publish somebody who's so proletarian, right, focused is already kind of curious in the mm -hmm. um, Anyway, okay, so all of these questions once again. Uh, well, does, I, I, yeah, does, is, it, is there is there anything you can get out of that, or should I? No, more? yes, I mean okay. this question of um, is the like invisibility versus omniscience and if the poor person is the omniscient narrator then is there a different universality there I mean I think that's exactly what I'm trying to figure out kind of and I'm not I mean like in thinking about you know what's the difference between like in Anna Karenina, you have just every single different character's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And um, Roshenikov is also moving between different characters' perspectives. But it's different in a sense like it doesn't... Um, but exactly, yeah, how to define that difference is, I think, what I'm trying to... Um, figure out and and um I think it's a really worthwhile yeah. question yeah, yeah. yeah. And, not, and a difficult one yeah. yeah you might even look at things like Du Bois mm, yeah um for omniscience and invisibility mm -hmm. okay or you know um Alison yeah there are moments also mm -hmm. we're talking about yeah. Dostoevsky right there's more there are moments also in poor folk yeah. uh where this is made in Ludi, right where this is made really explicit yeah this uh, this way in which I'm, except right in poor folk. What's curious, right, is that is that he feels too visible mm -hmm. as a poor person. Right, right. He's he's too right. Everybody's looking at him and judging him and seeing the, whether he was wearing the right boots and mm -hmm. and at the same time, then you know, at the beginning and then towards the end, he says this big kind of invective against you know why are we all trying to be shoemakers. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't aren't there more important things to do than yeah? 
anyway, okay, yeah. curious, no, curious okay. history. I, think, I yeah. think it's something to keep thinking about. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and I'd be really interested to, um, it seems as though the 1930s was, the 1930s was basically the time when the most useful collected works were put together for Dushetnikov, Pomielowski, and Rivita, like the ones that have documents and notes and things. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, so I would also be interested in, you know, that moment. why, yeah, right. exactly. why exactly was that happening then? Um, because by the fifties and sixties, all you got are Dostoevsky, and, right? Yeah, and it never it never happened again. Like those were the those are the editions that are most useful, and um, their work has been continued. You know, it's published in the eighties and nineties, and it's like easy to get a hold of regular kind of trade editions, mm -hmm. but um, n not the scholarly okay. editions after that. Yeah. So, Rosen, that's your project. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's an interesting little bit. Does anybody else have any questions? I think we're actually kind of out of time. Well, we are, in fact. So, yeah, thank you so much, Helen. Thank you. Thank you.